Hello and welcome to a new topic in this module, DNA fingerprinting. We'll start by looking at what DNA fingerprinting is, how it works, and learn about some of its applications. Now let's talk about what DNA fingerprinting is. Although most of the genome is identical among all humans, there's some amount of variation in regions not involved in protein coding. These regions are called non-coding regions. So when we're looking at this piece of the entire genome, there are some regions which contain genes that encode proteins, and there are lots of other regions interspersed among them called the non-coding regions because they don't code for any proteins. Within these non-coding regions are sequences called short tandem repeats or or STRs. Now, these can vary from three to four nucleotides that are repeated over and over again. And the number of these repeats varies from one individual to the other. In DNA fingerprinting, scientists take advantage of this variation to identify and distinguish among individuals. The person who invented DNA fingerprinting is Dr. Alec Jeffries at the University of Leicester, who in the 1970s noticed that there were repeating units in DNA, which at the time he called stutters, at specific regions. These stutters were later called variable number tandem repeats or VNTRs. When he analyzed the pattern of these stutters, from his technician's DNA and compared it to that from her parents, he found that she had inherited the stutters from them. This finding eventually led him to develop a technique through which you could identify individuals based on the differences in the number of repeats they possessed. Currently, STR has mostly replaced other older techniques like VNTR analysis or RFLP analysis. During STR analysis, DNA is extracted from samples. The samples can be from blood, hair, semen, cheek swab, etc. Specific STR regions or loci are amplified via PCR using primers that are complementary to these STR loci. So these primers help direct the polymerase to amplify these specific STR sequences. The resulting fragments are then separated using gel electrophoresis and compared between the samples. And you can use the traditional format of gel electrophoresis or a more advanced format called capillary electrophoresis followed by the detection and identification of the STR sequences. Let's look at an example of results from a crime investigation. In this example, samples were collected from the site of the crime, suspect one and suspect two. So there were two suspects in this crime and their DNA was analyzed and the STRs in each of these sample DNAs were amplified and analyzed via gel electrophoresis. So what we're seeing is the actual gel containing the separated STRs. Now, if you compare the pattern of STRs between these three samples, you can see that the pattern of STRs of suspect two match those of the evidence. You can see the same pieces of DNA. So these would be the STRs in both samples. And this last one down here. 
So we can say with a certain amount of confidence that suspect two was at the scene of crime. Suspect one, on the other hand, the pattern of these STRs does not match those uh, from the evidence. Often these days, this process is automated in that the STRs are first amplified using PCR. While they're being amplified, they are labeled with fluorescent molecules that can be detected in a fluorescent spectrometer. After the samples are amplified by PCR, they are separated using gel electrophoresis. But in this case, it is capillary gel electrophoresis. This picture shows how capillary electrophoresis works. The sample is placed in a vial along with the buffer, a tube through which the DNA sample will run connects this sample vial to a second vial in which the sample would eventually travel. This also contains buffer. Two electrodes, one negative and one positive, are placed in each of these sample vials. When current flows between the two electrodes, the samples travel from one electrode to the other, passing through a detector, which in this case is a fluorometer. And eventually reach the, the other electrode. As they pass through the fluorometer, the DNA fragments that are smaller or lighter will travel first through the tube and will be detected first by the fluorometer. The heavier fragments will travel slower and will be detected later by the fluorometer. Note that the capillary contains a gel matrix similar to the one used in gel electrophoresis. This process is carried out separately for samples for suspect 1, suspect 2, and the evidence. So you would run three separate samples through this apparatus. After the samples are done running through the gel electrophoresis and are detected by the fluorometer, what comes out is a profile of the STR fragments. The ones with lower mass, as you can see, have come out sooner compared to the STR fragments with higher mass. This is for one sample, say for suspect 1. We would obtain another graph for suspect 2 and the evidence and compare all of the three graphs together to find out which one of them matches with the evidence. The FBI uses 13 core STR loci to routinely identify individuals within the United States. So this is a list of the STR loci. There are 13 of them. And on the right is an example, again, of a case where these loci are matched with suspects that are thought to be involved in a crime with the sample from the evidence. And as you can see here, the pattern for these 13 core STR loci matches between the evidence sample and suspect B. Other applications of DNA fingerprinting include the identification of organisms for conservation purposes, paternity testing, and immigration purposes. Thank you.